So thank you so much, Lois, for the kind introduction. Thanks so much for having me here today. It's really a pleasure. And so I decided today to talk about um, a theme that is really central in my research efforts. Where, when, and why does it train? And of course, the focus here is going to be on our planet, so on Earth. But a lot of what I do is trying to extend theories that we develop for the Earth's atmosphere to other planetary atmospheres as well. And this question is of fundamental importance as we are, with our anthropogenic activities, significantly altering rainfall patterns uh, through uh, global warming. So I'm going to start by showing you a movie of not rainfall itself, but measurements of clouds uh, from satellite. And I'm going to start this movie. This is a collage. Uh, uh, of um, uh, cloud, the cloud field from images taken from satellites for one specific month, uh, a month of July. So this is uh, Northern uh, Hemisphere summer. And I let this uh, loop through uh, several times. I'd like to look at it for a while and then I'll try to comment on some of the features that I would like you to uh, focus on. Sorry, I think I need to do this. So the brighter, the white, the higher uh, the clouds. So this is something uh, to keep in mind. So you might have seen similar movies before, but you have not. I think that the first thing that really strikes you is how chaotic, how turbulent the cloud field is in the sense that it involves um, features on many different scales uh, both spatial and temporal uh, skills. And this is a reflection of the turbulent nature of the underlying motions, atmospheric motions in, win in which these clouds are embedded and formed. But again, if you stare at you know, movies such as this for a while, you see that some patterns uh, start to emerge. And I want you, for instance, to focus about, you know, the differences that strike you the most between the tropics, this region, let's say 30 degrees north and south of the equator and the extra uh, tropics. So first of all, you see that in the tropics, clouds tend to move from east to west. And that is because the winds in general in the tropics blow in this direction from east uh, to west. In general, in grade school, we learn, and that's something that my older son learned last year in fifth grade as part of his science curriculum, that weather always moves from west to east. And that is true for us, because we live outside of the deeper tropics. But if you live in the tropics, you always want to look east of where you live to make weather predictions, because that's the direction in which uh, the weather uh, is moving from. And so again, in the tropics, weather clouds move from east to west. In the extra tropics, it's the opposite direction. That's where, what, that's what we are usually uh, familiar uh, with. The other big difference between the tropics and the extra tropics is that you see that in the tropics, uh, these clouds, first of all, are deeper. Those are associated with very strong vertical motions, and they tend to be more granular. Typical cloud, individual clouds uh, have a scale of about one uh, mile. They can organize on bigger clusters, but you do see some of this granularity in this uh, field. Whereas outside of the tropics, and this is extremely evident in the southern hemisphere when it's winter there, you see filaments of clouds that tend to be very elongated and organized over much larger scales. We're talking about hundreds, even thousands of miles. And so this filamentary structure is associated with the development of typical, it's really a manifestation of you know, the development of typical weather systems in the extra tropics, patterns of high and low pressures, cyclones and anti-cyclones that we see every day on our weather maps. So these filaments that you see here, again, these are not really evident in the northern hemisphere for July because this is our, the July is the northern hemisphere summer. But these filaments, 
And the most extreme of these filament events are the atmospheric rivers that you might have heard of, especially this winter, in which we've been hidden by a few of these atmospheric rivers bringing abundant rain finally over uh, California, releasing us from the droughts. And again, these atmospheric rivers are nothing else but filaments where uh, atmospheric moisture is strongly concentrated so that in the most extreme cases, the <coughs> water flux is even larger than the Amazon River, the biggest uh, uh, river uh, on the Earth's um, surface. So this is already telling you that the dynamics of what controls cloud formation and precipitation in the tropics is very different from what? Uh, from the dynamics uh, associated with precipitation development in the extratropics. And my specialty is really thinking about the tropical atmosphere, so this will be uh, the focus today, although I'll try to hint at some of the interesting things related to extratropical precipitation as well. Again, I wanted to start with this because I think that these are really fascinating images that you know, our advances in technology have finally allowed. But this is not a direct measurement of precipitation. We do have measurements of precipitation based on different techniques, both ground-based and remotely based. And so we can produce maps of the distribution of precipitation over the Earth's surface, such as the one shown here. This represents the precipitation uh, globally uh, averaged over the 12 months of the years and over many, uh, many years. So the bluer the color, the largest the precipitation in uh, millimeter uh, per day. So it is pretty obvious from this map that again, if we focus in the tropics between 30 degrees north and south, this is where the most intense rainfall is actually concentrated. And if you have not, I'm sure that you've seen similar maps before, but if you have not, I think that the first thing that you notice is that really the most intense rainfall tends to fall over the oceans, not over the land. And in fact, over the um, tropical oceans, precipitation tends to, tends to be concentrated, intense rainfall tends to be concentrated in a band that is narrow in latitude, but very extended. Uh, in longitude. We call this feature the intertropical convergence zone or ITCZ for brevity. Again focusing on the tropics we do see however that intense rainfall is also found over near equatorial or subtropical land masses and we will see that especially as we move away from the equator precipitation over land in the subtropics is associated with strong seasonal features that is monsoonal circulations, and I'll go back to monsoonal circulations um, in, a little, uh, in a little bit. Uh, outside of the tropics, again north of 30 degrees north and south, you see that precipitation tends to be concentrated over oceanic basins primarily along storm tracks that are tilted band of rainfall from the southwest to the northeast. And this is where they're called storm tracks because this is where your typical extratropical storms, again, these patterns of cyclones tend to be usually, tend to preferentially uh, form. But again, today the focus is going to be primarily in the tropics. So this is the uh, map of precipitation that you get if you take a temporal average. Let's now do another average. And then let's average for each given latitude, let's average over longitude. And this is the distribution of precipitation that you obtain as a function of latitude as you move away from the equator towards the two poles in both hemispheres. So we find the typical pattern of alternating wet and drier zones with, no surprise, the wettest zone being around the equator drier zones around the subtropics. This is where we'll live, around 30 degrees off the equator. And then we have two uh, other wetter zones in the extratropics associated with this mid-latitude uh, storm uh, tracks. Notice, however, that again, we are not surprised by the fact that the wettest region on Earth is around the equator. This is where we have a lot of ocean, and this is where sunlight on the annual average tends to peak, but notice how maximum precipitation is not located right at the equator, but is displaced north of the equator at around eight degrees from the equator. Let me emphasize how if our planet was completely symmetric 
hemispherically, the two, the, these, the two hemispheres were completely symmetric, there would be no reason for precipitation to maximize off the equator. The reason that precipitation maximizes off the equator implies the existence of an asymmetry between the two hemispheres. And exactly what is this, uh, the relevant asymmetry that is the most important asymmetry in driving this displaced, northward displaced location of the intertropical convergence zone or ATCC is a question that has been addressed extensively in the literature. Um, one that is very plausible is that um, we have way more land mass in the northern hemisphere than we have in the southern hemisphere. And I hope that I will have time to show you a very simple numerical experiment that will allow to test us in, again, a very simple fundamental way whether this hypothesis is correct uh, or not. So, how is so what, what, what gives rise to these alternating patterns of wet and dry zones? These are, oh, so first of all, sorry, why does it rain? Sorry, this is a very, very schematic and very simple representation, but basically from a cloud parcel perspective, formation of clouds and hence precipitation, forgetting about the complexities associated with microphysics. So cloud formation is associated with ascending motion. If you start with a, a moist parcel, for instance, warm, over the Earth's ocean that contains a lot of water vapor. If you lift it up, the parcel will find itself at lower pressure, so it will expand and without any exchange of heat with the environment will do so adiabatically, so it will cool off and at one point it will reach a level where clouds will start forming where it has more water vapor, more water that actually can exist in the vapor phase and so any excess water will have to uh, condense out and form clouds and hence uh, precipitation. This is just a schematical uh, picture representation of the development of just single uh, isolated clouds. Uh, this is a very simplified picture because in reality um, if the atmosphere was completely clean and clear you would have to reach significant supersaturations before uh, condensation would occur but particles in the atmosphere help us because they serve as cloud condensation. Uh, nuclei. So mechanisms that um, cause air parcels to rise include instabilities in the atmosphere, the fact that for instance um, 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 at, uh, cloud par uh, air parcels in contact with the surface can warm up, they're also very moist so that creates uh, an unstable situation in which war uh, warm air will want to rise. There are other instabilities that I don't have time to discuss that are extremely important for the development of ascending motion in the Earth's atmosphere and therefore the development of clouds and precipitation and for instance obstacles, uh, existence of orographic for forcing associated with uh, mountain uh, ranges. From a large scale perspective, the, the fact that we have these large scale precipitation patterns are associated with regions where air preferentially rises and this is strongly tied to the atmospheric uh, general uh, circulation that here I decided to represent uh, by showing you the distribution again uh, looking at the long-term annual wind of the surface winds with vectors indicating the direction of the prevailing winds right near the surface and the color contours showing the speed and I do apologize I'm from Italy so I can only think in the metric system so here <laughs> The color scale is in meter per second, but I believe that the warmest thread, 10 meter per second, correspond to about 20 knots, if that's um, a reasonable unit uh, to use. So again, notice how the regions of strongest precipitation over the ocean, which is again here, north of the equator, is called the intertropical convergence zone because it represents the location in which lower level winds in the tropic converge. Um, if you keep converging uh, uh, winds, you would pile up mass and you cannot do it and so to conserve mass, mass will have to rise and so this intertropical convergence zone is associated with the large scale uh, port motion and that is linked to the development of intense uh, precipitation. Notice how winds in the tropics again between 30 degrees north and south blow preferentially from the east to west in association with the well-known easterly uh, trade winds 
that are almost global. This is the direction of the prevailing winds almost everywhere in the tropics, particularly evident in, over the ocean basin, with one exception. The exception being what happens over the northern Indian Ocean. Notice how in the annual average, the northern Indian Ocean has very, very weak wind speeds. And also you notice the direction is in the, the wind is blowing in the opposite direction is this very, very light annual wind is blowing from the west to east and is also moving away from the equator. It's moving poleward rather than equatorward, as you see everywhere else. And that is because over the Indian Ocean you do have very strong seasonal cycle of winds, with winds during the winter blowing from the northeast to the southwest, as you see everywhere else in the tropics, but during the summer completely reversing and blowing from the southwest to the northeast in association with the development of the Indian monsoon here. And these winds, these monsoonal winds during the summer are so strong that they tend to dominate the uh, annual average. Outside of the tropics, you see that the winds uh, blow in the opposite direction. In fact, they not only blow from the west to the east, but they also have a poleward uh, component. Again, the link to precipitation is somewhat obvious from this map, but we said that precipitation is strongly linked to patterns of large-scale ascending motion. So one way to represent these large-scale patterns of ascending or possibly descending motion is, again, taking an average in longitude and showing how mass recirculates in a plane that cuts through latitude and in the vertical direction. And this is what is shown here. Um, again, this on the x-axis, I am showing latitude starting from the equator, moving towards the poles in the uh, both hemispheres, and then pressure, which in atmospheric science is really a, pro a proxy for height. Okay? And so again, in the tropics, you see that the way in which mass recirculates describes two cells that are called the Hadley cells or Hadley circulations with ascending motion near the equator, these are where air parcels tend to rise while, while once they hit the tropopause, they hit a lid, and so they start moving poleward in both hemispheres, and then air parcels somewhat descend at around 30 degrees north and south, and then you have return flow close to the surface. Again, this is this flow towards the equator that you see in the tropics as you average over uh, longitude. Um, so again, notice how exactly the same way in which, well, first of all, the first important thing is that maximum precipitation tends to be co-located with uh, the ascending motion, the ascending branches of the Hadley circulation, with in fact the center of these two cells, the southern and the northern cell, being located around 8 degrees north of the equator where maximum precipitation is in fact located. In exactly the same way in which precipitation is not maximizing at the equator, you also see that the two Hadley cells are not completely symmetric, with the southern cell being a little bit wider, a little bit stronger than the uh, northern uh, cell. Notice how the tropics, and in fact this could be taken a definition of the tropical region in the Earth's atmosphere, the, the tropics are defined as the latitudes in which the Hadley cells exist, and also the latitudes in which near surface winds are easterlies. Here I'm showing again zone, um, averages in longitude of the surface zonal winds and negative values represent flow from east to west and positive values represent flows, a flow from uh, west uh, to east. Okay, so ascending motion associated with intense precipitation, whereas descending motion that are located around 30 degrees north and south correspond to dry regions. And that is because as air parcels go up, most of their water vapor precipitates out. So these parcels move at higher latitudes with very little water vapor that can exist at these very low temperatures higher up, and then they descend. So here you have a very dry air that tends to descend as it descends, it finds itself at higher pressure. So this is air that will warm adiabatically through adiabatic compression, and this tends to suppress any development of strong vertical motions and hence uh, precipitation. 
So let me emphasize how this Hadley circulation is what, in jargon, we call thermally direct. What does that mean? It simply means that this is a circulation in which warm air from the surface goes up, colder air from higher up goes down. So this is a circulation that is, that is what we expect, right? So this is a circulation that is converting potential energy into kinetic energy of atmospheric motions. Notice one thing, if we start looking outside of the tropics, we find two weaker cells in both hemispheres, the Ferrell cells, where something very interesting happens. Here we have that colder, relatively colder hair from higher latitudes goes up and warmer air goes down. This is something that we do not expect. We need to do work to bring down warmer air um, and lift uh, colder air. And so this is a circulation. These circulations, the Ferrell cells, are driven by completely different dynamics. They actually use kinetic energy of other motions uh, to convert into potential energy. Um, and the dynamics of the cells cannot be understood without consideration of uh, what happens longitude by longitude and how storms associated with cyclones and anticyclones um, develop uh, there. Again, this is just to say that the dynamics of the Hadley uh, circulation that really have a strong impact on weather patterns over the tropical atmosphere is very different than the dynamics in the uh, extra uh, in the extra tropics. Other important oh so one so again so here so the the Hadley circulation just the two points that I want to emphasize is that uh, wetter regions are associated with the ascending branches of the Hadley cell and dry regions are associated with the uh, descending branches of the Hadley cell. And this is a schematic that is uh, summarized here. Again, how do we understand the different climatic zones in the Earth's atmosphere? Again, equatorial uh, region, abandoned rain, whereas the subtropics tend to be, in general, very dry regions. We have the other extratropical uh, wet zones that I showed you before. Again, these are characterized by different dynamics and there you do have ascending motions, but usually those are not strong, the strong vertical motions that you see in the Hadley circulations, but are gently gliding um, ascending motions in which warm air glides over uh, colder air in association with warm uh, and cold fronts of air uh, meeting uh, each other. Again, so very very uh, different dynamics. So going back to this picture, hence I want to emphasize one point. The features of the Hadley circulation, such as the location of the center of its ascending branches, the width at position of the descending branch, and the strength of this overturning, so how much mass is actually, and how fast mass is circulating around this Hadley circulations have a fundamental impact on the Hertz hydrological cycle because of the reasons that we have just discussed. So we would love to have a close theory of these features of the Hadley circulation, such as the strength or the width of the Hadley circulation in terms of mean state um, parameters, such as the pole to equator temperature difference or maybe the temperature stratification in the vertical direction, or, or planetary parameters, such as the radius of your planet, or the rotation rate of your planet, we do not have any such closed theories. And so this is a fundamental question in climate science. How is the Hadley cell, and again here is even without any consideration of variations in longitude, how is the Hadley cell going to respond to uh, perturbations, to radiative perturbations, for instance, those associated with increased in, uh, greenhouse gases uh, concentration in the atmosphere, okay? So again, let me show again this. Again, now we understand at least uh, at a first order how this uh, um, patterns of wetter zone near the equator and drier zones in the subtropics uh, come uh, about. And this is particularly true if we do not consider any deviation um, in longitude, right? Just taking an average in longitude. But in reality, if now we start focusing on each single latitude and look at longitudinal variations 
those are not insignificant. Those are large and of course are affected by the fact that our planet, in our planet, any single longitude has a meaning because it is associated with variations in land sea contrast. We do have continents, we do have mountain regions, ranges that make every single longitude different than the other at the same uh, longitude. For instance, notice how we say that in general, this is where we live. Yeah, sure, 30 degrees tends to be dry. It depends where you are. 30 degrees is dry here in Southern California, but it is much wetter, for instance, over uh, Eastern Asia. Um, so this spatial variability arises for very different reasons and one is the fact that of course our planet is not zonally symmetric but I mean again longitude does have a, a meaning because we have uh, continents, we have uh, mountain ranges, we have um, uh, sea surface temperature distributions over the ocean that do depend on, uh, on longitude. But especially here in the subtropics, this spatial variability is also a manifestation of strong variability within one year associated with the seasonal cycle of precipitation uh, there. And so let me try to emphasize this point, the temporal variability associated with the seasons by showing you similar maps of precipitation over the Earth's surface, but for the month of July, going back to the month of July, that is Northern Hemisphere summer, and the corresponding map for January, that is Southern uh, Hemisphere summer. So this is July, and this is January. I'm going to toggle between the two a few times. So notice how, if again, we start by focusing, for instance, over the ocean, focus over the Pacific Ocean, that is really a great example. Notice how there is a seasonal cycle of precipitation there, but that is somewhat muted, both in terms of intensity and in terms of location. Notice how for, you know, over a great, a large range of longitudes, precipitation maximizes over the Pacific Ocean, always north of the equator, even in January. In January, the insulation maximizes in the southern hemisphere, not in the northern hemisphere, and yet precipitation does not follow over the ocean, especially over the Pacific Ocean, the uh, maximum uh, insular uh, insulation. Now, instead of focusing over the ocean, focus over a subtropical landmass, pick the continent of your preference. You could pick Asia, you could pick the southwestern North America, and notice how there the seasonal cycle of precipitation is way more extreme. Here you have that very, very dry winters are being followed by very, very wet summers. Okay? And so this um, rainfall that is primarily peaked in subtropical continents during the uh, summer is associated with the development of monsoonal circulations and associated rainfall there. I think that Probably um, each of you uh, is familiar with the Indian monsoon, which in fact is part of the biggest, mon bigger monsoon system developing over entire Southeast Asia here. But despite being the most well known, it's not the only monsoon system in the Earth's atmosphere. We have basically monsoon systems almost over every subtropical continent. In the Northern Hemisphere, we have a monsoon over Western Africa also called the Sahel monsoon, and we have a monsoon which is a much smaller scale. It's a whimper monsoon system, but we do have a monsoon over uh, North America, and we have also corresponding monsoon systems in the Southern Hemisphere in the, during the Southern uh, Hemisphere summer. So let me here <coughs> emphasize how monsoons for many, many decades, and in fact even centuries, have been interpreted as sea breeze circulations driven by the contrast in thermal properties between the land and the uh, ocean. Somewhat independent of the overall overturning circulation patterns in the uh, extra tropics, uh, I'm sorry, in the tropical regions, it is becoming more and more increasingly understood and I think that this precipitation maps reveals that this is exactly the case, how in fact we should think about monsoons as an inherent part of this overturning hardly circulation in the tropical atmospheres 
And those are just regions where the precipitation maximum can move away from the tropical regions into the subtropical land masses. There is a fundamental link and there are theoretical reasons to think of monsoons as regional and seasonal manifestations of the precipitation patterns in the tropic and the associated uh, overturning. And I hope that I'll have time later uh, to return uh, back uh, to this question. So this is just based on observations. As a climate scientist, I, oh, and so again, here is a so short summary. Migration of maximum precipitation over subtropical continents is associated to the monsoons, and this is a fundamental part of the overall uh, tropical precipitation and circulation uh, pattern. Um, so again, I'm a climate scientist and I make extensive use of uh, climate models. So one fair question to ask is to what extent can climate models reproduce this large-scale precipitation features that I've been describing? Um, so again, just a very simple schematic. I think that you're all familiar with climate models. Those are just mathematical representations of the um, equations that describe uh, the uh, atmospheric and, in fact, oceanic motions, for that matter. Uh, we need to discretize these equations on a grid in the horizontal and the vertical direction. And in addition to uh, solving for the equations that tell us how air and water is moving around in both the horizontal and vertical direction, of course, these motions are driven by physical processes that need to also be uh, somewhat um, prescribed or um, um, put into the uh, climate uh, models. A lot of those physical processes are actually occurring on scales that are smaller than the grid scale, uh, especially because we want to run these climate models globally and we want to be able to integrate them in time for large um, portions, <coughs> large time intervals. Uh, and so a lot of these processes act on smaller scales. They are not resolved and so we need to make guesses. We need to make assumptions as we think that these smaller scale processes depend on things that we can solve for. And these are come with an old suite of parametrizations in climate models where exactly you are trying to parametrize pro processes that are not resolved in terms of processes or variables that are resolved and solved for in the uh, climate models. So now going back to our questions, well, how do climate models do uh, in terms of reproducing the distribution of uh, tropical uh, rainfall um, that I showed you before. So this is the picture that emerges if you take many simulations for, from state-of-the-art climate models. There are many now that exist under uh, present-day conditions and you average them. So in general you do see that models tend to reproduce the general patterns of tropical precipitation being primarily concentrated along the ocean, variability dry regions in the uh, subtropics, variability with longitude, storm tracks in the extra tropics. But now if you start looking carefully and for instance you look at how this uh, multimodal mean precipitation compares to observation, this is the biases, that is you subtract the observed uh, precipitation, this are the difference between the simulated precipitation and the observed precipitation. And so while, you know, at the first glance you would say, yeah, models do pretty well, when you really start looking at the biases, those are large biases. Those are large differences from the observed precipitation. For instance, just to pick uh, a region uh, that I spend a lot of time thinking of, the Indian or Asian monsoon region, most models tend to have a wet bias that is, they simulate way more precipitation over the equatorial ocean and a dry bias over land. But there are many other biases in general. Precipitation over land is extremely hard to simulate with the state-of-the-art climate models. There is another bias that has been extremely um, persistent uh, and very hard to improve, which is the so-called double ITCC bias. That is, notice how models tend to split the precipitation over the Pacific Ocean into somewhat different convergence zones, one in the northern and one in the southern hemisphere. The one in the southern hemisphere uh, is way more intense than what we actually see in 
uh, in observations. Then, of course, the question is, okay, so given these biases in present-day simulations to start with, uh, what do these models tell us about projected uh, precipitation, for instance, at the end of the 21st uh, century? So this is, again, based on multi-model multi means, that is, we take many, many models, we average their response together, and these are the projected uh, rainfall changes over two different time slices during the 21st century, one around the middle, one at the end of the 24th century, under very aggressive, aggressive emission scenarios. Okay, so the models all run with the same forcing, same greenhouse gas concentration increases. And so the color represents the precipitation change in percentage. And pay attention to the stippling. The stippling represent the region where models tend to agree in the magnitude and sign of their response. And if the force signal, which means the signal that we expect being forced by increased greenhouse gases, is actually larger than the year-to-year -year variability that models represent. And here, the picture is a little bit depressing in the sense that you see very little stippling in the tropical regions. I mean, it starts maybe emerging somewhere um, in the, towards the end of the 21st century. But this is to say that there's still a lot of uncertainty on precipitation changes in the uh, tropics. And here I'm re-quoting or somewhat changing a quote taken from the uh, most recent IPCC assessment report. Uncertainties remain large in most tropical regions, primarily because of circulation changes that have been difficult to constrain. So let me be a little bit more clear about what I mean by circulation changes. And also, let me try to convert this somewhat pessimistic message to a more optimistic message. That is to say, are we climate scientists completely clueless as to what we should expect in terms of precipitation changes in the tropics? And the answer is no, we are not that clueless. Especially there are certain robust features of precipitation changes that we do understand and those are associated with how we understand precipitation forms and how that is linked, for instance, to the circulation patterns that I showed you before. So let me again try to emphasize what are these robust responses to warming in terms of precipitation. One thing that we know for sure is that in a warmer climate there will be more moisture in the atmospheric column and that is based on a very simple and fundamental physical relationship called the clausius clapeyron relationship that gives us the dependence of the saturation vapor pressure. You can think of how much water vapor can exist just at saturation and the vapor pressure itself is just a function, and a very strong function for that matter, of temperature. So we have more water vapor that can exist at saturation if we warm the temperature. So we can predict using uh, global mean surface, uh, current global mean surface temperatures that the amount of moisture that exists in the atmosphere will increase by 7% just based on this fundamental physical relation if you warm the planet by one degree. Okay? How about precipitation? Here we're just saying the water vapor that exists uh, in the atmosphere. So if we now take different models and we average globally, we look at the percentage change in starting with water vapor. Again, this is the water vapor that exists in an atmospheric column and you average globally over the planet. This is the behavior that if you find across climate models, that is the ch percentage change as a function of temperature, surface temperature change. And you find that not surprisingly, this increases at a rate that is very similar to the clausius clapeyron theoretical relationship. This is how much water vapor exists in the atmosphere. How about precipitation? Again, you take exactly the same simulations. How much precipitation changes for a given change of temperature? We find that the precipitation increases at a slower rate than that of the wolf or vapor increases. And it's again, it's a very robust. Notice that most climate models will give you more or less the same percentage increase. Globally, precipitation increases by about 2% per degree of warming. So why? Why is, that, why is there that mismatch? And I don't have time to review the theory, but we do have a very strong theoretical grasp 
as to why this happens. And let me just say that while precipitation per se in any given climate depends on both availability of moisture and availability of energy, when you perturb the climate, the precipitation change is constrained, is limited by the availability of energy. Okay? So there are reasons by which precipitation will increase with the temperature at a slower rate than the amount of water vapor that exists globally in the planet. And let me emphasize how this implies, if you think of how much precipitates being some sort of product with it, how much um, air mass goes up and how much moisture you have, the fact that moisture goes up more rapidly than precipitation implies that the overall circulation that brings air up needs to slow down. And in fact, again, there's also theories that do explain why, in general, we do expect the Hadley circulation, that is a lot of the atmospheric motion associated with the large-scale ascending pattern, will slow down with, with climate. Again, this is globally. Then when you start thinking about more regional levels, this is where um, all the uh, details uh, start to really nag you. So going back to the um, then hydrological cycle, that is the precipitation, Let's assume that there are no other changes in, for instance, atmospheric circulation of relative humidity in the atmosphere. If the only thing that changed was the amount of water vapor that exists in the atmospheric column, then the associated precipitation changes that we expect would amplify the already existing uh, precipitation patterns. That is the so-called thermodynamic effect. Again, here we're just considering what would happen if nothing else changed but just more water vapor was available in the atmosphere, then we would predict wet regions to become wetter and drier regions to become drier. This is a well-known wet get wetter uh, pattern. And for instance, this is an example of whether this works or not. Again, here the solid line represents the net precipitation. Here I'm just the change in net precipitation. If you double CO2 in a global uh, climate model, this is net precipitation. What it means is that you are subtracting from precipitation the local evaporation. So you're looking at the contribution of precipitation coming about from the winds moving around and converging or diverging moisture from any given location. Again, averaging in longitude and showing this distribution as a function of uh, latitude. The dashed line represents the thermodynamic contribution that is just the change that you obtain keeping winds fixed, not letting relative humidity change, just considering changes associated with changes in water uh, vapor or moisture uh, content. And again, at least when you look at the zonal average, there is a good level of agreement. A lot of the total response is explained by this thermodynamic uh, contribution. Okay? Okay, so here I emphasize the things that we do know. These are called the robust responses uh, to uh, warming. But then let me show you this, this figure again. And yet there's still a lot of uh, inconsistency or a wide spread between, you know, in projections from different climate models. And why that is the case? Again, well, while the thermodynamic response, again, the wet get wetter pattern is robust across climate models, Uncertainty in precipitation response is large because, first of all, the wet get wetter mechanism is telling you that wet regions will become wetter and drier regions will become drier. But yet, we already know that the simulated present day uh, precipitation in climate models is affected by their own biases. So you are amplifying those uh, biases. And then the problem is that this is an important uh, change, but it's not the only change. Circulation changes will have, especially at a regional level, a contribution that is at least as strong as the uh, thermodynamic uh, contribution. And this, again, to be a little bit more concrete as to what I mean by uh, the circulation response, for instance, we know that the Hadley cell will weaken or the Huntley sand will expand, the storm tracks will shift, and climate models will project different circulation responses. So which one is right? It's a question that we still don't know. And then I'm sure that this is something that you probably have all heard, at least in some ways, there is a large uncertainty in the cloud response that has a huge imprint on the projected response, both at the global 
and a regional level in different uh, climate uh, models. And that is because clouds are strongly, strongly, strongly tied to the circulation. So models that do different clouds will also have different circulation responses that will fit back on the cloud response. And again, this is an extremely rich topic. There is no way I can go into any detail, but let me show you uh, just one important result as to the importance of this cloud response and how this leads to uh, a wide spread uh, in projections by different climate models. So let me try to explain what I'm showing here. So here we are performing with many different um, state-of-the-art climate models, experiments in which we double the CO2 and then we looked after many, many decades how the global mean surface temperature responds to this CO2 doubling. So this measure is usually called climate sensitivity, exactly, is the change in global mean surface temperature per doubling of CO2. And so what do climate models tell us? Ah, the spread is large, right? Some models that are, have a relatively low sensitivity will give you an increase of two degrees, but some other models will give you an increase that is larger than five degrees. And I should mention that this spread in the equilibrium climate sensitivity has not changed through generations of climate models. We have not been able to better constrain it with uh, more and more realistic and complex uh, climate models. But now let's look at the response of two individual climate models. Those are both uh, US climate models, development modeling centers, extremely well respected. In my um, research group, we use both the anchor and the GFDL uh, climate models, and they tend to lie at opposite extremes of low and high climate sensitivity. So there are many reasons why, again, the projected climate sensitivity of these two models is so different. One is around 4.5, the other one is lower, smaller than two. But one of the most fundamental reasons is that they project completely different changes in cloud patterns. So one model projects a decrease in cloud amounts in the regions highlighted here. Those tends to be low clouds, whereas the NCAR model projects an increase in this cloud amounts. Again, which one is right? We don't know. <laughs> okay, so let me hear, and I'll spend just maybe because I want to leave some time for questions. I really have not been able to go too much into my own research, but I want to give you at least a brief sense of how I spend my time trying to address these open questions. So what controls position, strength, and variability of tropical rainfall remains an open challenge in climate science. It's really a central theme in my research efforts, and I spend a lot of time thinking about how these large-scale circulations, the Hadley cell and Monsoonal circulation, impact uh, the hydrological cycle and the precipitation uh, distribution. And I really try to use many different tools that are based on observations but also based on modeling work. But because models are so complex, uh, how do we use models uh, to make progress? And that is what I want to spend my last maybe three minutes uh, talking about. So what I spend a lot of time thinking of is, you know, how can we use to make progress models with different complexity? And what do I mean by different complexity? What do I have in mind? So on the one uh, you know, end of the spectrum, we do have the fully coupled comprehensive models that I somewhat schematically very briefly described before. This have become more and more complex, especially <laughs> in the past couple of decades, to the extent that we talk about climate models now as Earth system models. Those are models that try to represent the interactions between different components of the climate system, the atmosphere, the ocean, the cryosphere, the biosphere, and so on. But being able to simulate more does not necessarily and automatically result in increased understanding. In fact, maybe it's even less so because a lot of these processes, such as for instance clouds, are poorly understood and poorly constrained in isolation, let, you lo let alone when you couple them with other poorly constrained and poorly understand feedback. So what do we do? So one approach that we have taken has been using much simpler climate models that still resolve the general circulation of the atmosphere. And one tool that we use extensively in my group is a very idealized climate model. So let me try to be clear about what I mean by idealized. The first idealization is that in its simplest configuration, 
this model doesn't have any lensy contrast, none whatsoever. I am coupling the atmosphere to just a slab of ocean. So I'm already removing those difference in longitudes that give rise to a lot of differences in temperature or rainfall patterns. And also the physics that is represented in the model is way simpler. We are trying to really go to, you know, what is it that drive, drives a general circulation of the atmosphere? So we have a very simplified representation of how the atmosphere interacts with radiation. But for instance, we get rid of clouds. We don't have clouds in this model. What it means is that as water vapor condenses out, latent heat is being released. That's an important driver of tropical circulations. But once rain, liquid water forms, it's automatically precipitated out. So we don't have to worry about the coupling between clouds and uh, radiation. And one might say, well, what can you say about the climate system? And it turns out that we can say a lot. We can say what would be the robust responses to certain perturbations in the absence of clouds that anyway we do not understand. Okay? But then the gap between these two uh, classes of models is huge. So how do you connect the dots? And you have to do it somewhat smartly. And so we really try to fill you know, this gap and this big um, uh, gap in the parameter space by increasing progressively, uh, increasing complexity in a progressive way. For instance, we can retain the idealized configuration of an aqua planet that is a planet that doesn't have any continents, but then start including physical processes such as clouds in how uh, those interactions are represented, or we can go in the opposite direction and we can retain the idealized physics and uh, start introducing, uh, for instance, continents or mountain ranges and see what are those effects uh, in the simulated general circulation of the atmosphere. And again, this is a way in which you can make progressive and fundamental understanding because you can separate the effects associated with the physics from the ones that are associated with the continental configuration or topography uh, and so on. And I had some examples of what this approach has taught us in the years of spent at Caltech, but I'm running out of time, so I'll stop here. And if you're interested, uh, I can take some questions on it. So I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. It's increasing, but it increases at a rate smaller than how much water vapor increases with so the temperature. It eventually level off? No, it keeps increasing. With it keeps it. Um, well, energy yes. Availability yes. Limited. Yes. It's in the sense that what, what's limited is that the scaling at which precipitation responds globally uh, rates the, limits the rate at which it increases. And basically, you can think of that, you can, we can understand that both in terms, there are two fundamental energy budgets. One is the surface energy budget. The other one is the uh, atmospheric energy budget. From the surface energy budget, we understand that when you integrate globally, how much you evaporate from the surface needs to be balanced by how much you precipitate out at equilibrium. And how much you can evaporate um, is strongly limited, cannot increase as strongly as water vapor amounts in the atmosphere. Is it, um, is it rain and snow? No, uh, this is um, primarily rain. I was wondering what's going on in Norway in January. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, no. So again, this is a, it's, it's a great question. And in fact, and also one thing that I would like to point out, um, here I just talked about mean precipitation, what it means if I average over many months or I average a month and many years. But the truth is that, especially for societal impacts, we, know not, we not just care about, we do not just care about how much rain it falls on average, but does it fall steadily over one day or does it fall in large amounts over three hours? That is a huge, huge difference. And so when we start thinking about those type of variability, um, and you know, and rainfall intensity and frequency. Then a lot of the things, such as the microphysics of precipitation, is it just rain? Is it mixed phase? Is it snow? Um, is extremely important. But we haven't even started addressing. In my research group, we haven't even starting. We haven't even started addressing those questions. Um, so it's primarily preset rainfall, just yeah, liquid water. Yes. When you have this water vapor increasing, two, two things. 
Um, does that actually lead to any cooling because of evaporative cooling on the surface of the Earth? Yeah. And secondly, when you're not having a comparable increase in precipitation, does that mean typical humidity around the globe is going to be higher? No, actually, <laughs> so first of all, exactly. So the, um, the, when you think about the surface energy budget, uh, evaporation is the way by, it's the most effective way by which the energy of the surface is maintained, that is the incoming radiation, which could be especially absorbed sunlight or downwelling long wave, tends to warm the surface and the way the surface adjusts to equilibrium is by evaporating um, a lot. But that is somewhat limited because, in fact, especially near the surface, relative humidity remains constant. Relative humidity does not change dramatically. It stays about 80%. There are, of course, variations here where only if you go to the ocean, it's 80%. And because relative humidity doesn't change much, again, evaporation cannot change at the same rate as the atmospheric water vapor that you have um, in the atmosphere. Yes. So the two are strongly connected. Let me say this, a lot of this, and that's something that is also assumed here, I said in the wet get wetter mechanism, we are assuming that the um, relative humidity does not change. So the question is, is that a good assumption? It's a good assumption only if you are close to the surface, because anyway, you are close to saturation. As we go higher up, it's now becoming increasingly obvious that relative humidity can change, um, and those small changes, because those are very small relative humidity, but those small changes have a huge impact on the radiative balance. But we haven't started really understanding completely the implications of those changes higher up in the troposphere, and stratosphere for the matter. <coughs> yes? Back on your global chart, like now and out in the future. Uh, which one? <laughs> This one? No, back the other way. Right oh, this, yes. Okay. So there's a lot less water in the air out of the future. Um, dramatically. Well, it depends where you're looking at, right? The blues represent... Oh, they call that stripe section is a lot less in the future than it is... The back. stripe section is not... So if you integrate, I mean, if you average globally, this would correspond to about, I don't know exactly... Um, Again, it corresponds to more or less the same rate. It increases 2%. The, the dash represents the regions where a force signal has yet to emerge. That is to say, you look at this response averaged over 20 years, and you compare that change with any change that you can have from year to year. And that represents, again, those regions where the year-to-year -year variability within the model is still larger than the forced response. So that points out another big, I don't want to say problem, but um, again, one of the bigger issues um, that we have in, in, you know, in climate science is when we use these models to make projections, we need to average out that weather noise. Uh, there is, you know, the, the, the atmosphere is chaotic. And so we have to be very careful as to attributing certain responses that we see in climate models to the force response to anthropogenic warming or to other modes of natural variability in the climate system. Okay. You say the wet get wetter and the dry yes. get drier. Okay. So do we lose some wetness out of the atmosphere by going into the ocean? And no, not the wetness. The, for sure we, use, we lose heat. Water. No, more or less. So the ocean is not going to rise? The, the ocean is going to rise, but what I'm trying to say is that if you think about the cycling of water in the, in the, in the atmosphere, at the end, how much evaporates needs to balance how much it precipitates out. So, the, the so water, water is balanced. The rise would only come from snow melting. And, and also the expansion, thermal expansion of the oceans. That's the biggest, that's the biggest contribution. But, but you're totally, I mean, when you, again, here I focus primarily on, on the atmosphere, but the role of the ocean is huge. You might have heard the debate about the warming hiatus that has really been very prominent on the news in the sense that if you look at observations, there seems to have been a stalling in the trends in global mean surface temperature uh, 
until actually basically this year when we, you know, last year when we had a El Nino event, uh, where again, the rise of global mean surface temperature seemed to slow down based on observations. And this decrease in the warming trend is something that is not captured by climate models. So there has been a lot of debate as to how can we use these climate models. They cannot even reproduce the warming hiatus. We cannot trust them and blah, blah, blah. And the truth is that what the ocean is doing, and especially on decadal time scales, is extremely important. It's obvious that a lot of the warming is still to manifest because the other circulation can transport that warming deeper down in the ocean. And this is associated with modes of variability, such as, for instance, La Nina or El Nino years. And so one El Nino year or, you know, five La Nina years can have a different imprint on, you know, again, what on any specific year the global mean surface temperature is doing. But if you average those out, you still clearly see a warming trend.